coming up on Man Enough. Keeping a group of people that light you up, that support you, is the most important aspect to success, to live in a happy, joyful life. I suggest that everybody audits their friend group. Are they an asset or are they a liability in my life? How do they really make me feel? Don't just keep it up here. Don't, don't just keep it in your mind like I'm going to change my life. No, put it on paper. I think it's so important to really structure the people around you because energy is contagious. Being man enough, what does that mean? It's really manly to mess up, admit you're wrong, and then grow. I couldn't accept that I was evil, so maybe I'm broken, but those broken things could be corrected. Intimacy between a father and a son is me just wanting to like put my head in your lap. I love you, son. You haven't called me a benevolent sexist, but my experience is women are better. Even if it's a positive, it's still not equality. I don't blame men for that. I just blame the system. This is Man Enough. Hey everybody, welcome back to Man Enough. Everyone who's tuning in right now, uh, I'm Jamie Heath. And I'm got, Liz Plank. Uh, Christopher Rivas uh, in the house today. <gasps> Who are you st- sitting in for? I'm sitting in for the one and only Justin. Ugh. Oh man, this is tough like, shoes we've to done fill. many episodes with you now. So tough shoes to fill? Tough shoes to fill, but I they're know. being filled beautifully. They are oh, indeed. Thanks. Different mm-hmm. shoes. Mm-hmm. And why don't, you know what, before we move on, just give us like a quick synopsis in case someone's just tuning into this one, didn't hear other ones. Um, who, who are you? Welcome to Freshly Tuned In Person. Uh, mm-hmm. My name is Christopher Rivas. I'm an uh, author, actor, storyteller. Uh, I believe in telling stories that are entertaining that disrupt traditionally white spaces. And I have a podcast and a book called Brown Enough. Yeah. Beautiful. And that's why you're here, because you talk about these things and care about these things, and as we do, and we're aligned in our, in our work. So we, we love having you. In between shooting, we were having a conversation about dating. <laughs> Oh, wow. Share with us what you're comfortable with. <laughs> okay. The version of um, our conversation of just space. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so went on a few dates with someone, very nice person, very uh, generous, and but but also – well, so let me st- – go go back. I'll do it really TLDR. Jamie just learned what TLDR is. Um, and if you don't know what it means, it means t- too long, didn't read. And so the TLDR is Jamie is talking about all the wonderful things that he does for his wife, which I know he does. It's not just like a uh, brag. He's showing me this funny video about a guy doing that. And I was like, oh, I went a few days with someone who was like really, really, really nice. But then like there were all these strings attached. Like he felt very like entitled to my physical space and body in small and kind of big ways. Then I told, you know, him I wasn't really interested anymore. And then I got this like really immature response, like even like kind of a mean response, which only kind of proved me right, I guess. But like Jamie was basically like, what did you say when he did something that made you physically uncomfortable? And I was like, oh, I just kind of like moved his hand a little bit or like, I just kind of like, I kind of was just being convenient and be and kind of suppressing my discomfort and not talking about it. And yeah, you were just like, next time, you know, just go like, hey, um, I don't, you know, it's not a personal attack or whatever, but like, I don't feel comfortable with that level of whatever. And that that would start a conversation as opposed to what happened, which was, you know, this ended it in a weirdly kind of like, hmm. not a great way. Um, I still think I was right. Yes, I, I do like think, but but I also think this kind of highlights one of the difficulties which we, you know, explore in this podcast of like relationship and like particularly sex between women and men where I know that men have a different relationship to sex and physical intimacy than women do, even just on a like biological nurture nature way but also like growing up in a patriarchal society where I have been assaulted and my space has been violated and my female ancestors space have been violated and they've been abused and it's impacted me like that is like very deep deep Mm. and so and men you know it it just makes I think relationship between women and men so much more difficult and it yeah it's kind of sad because maybe it, we could have had a conversation about it and we can get over it. But, but yeah, it, like, anyway, I feel like this is like, I'm kind of a bummer. No, not at all. I'm, like I'm actually glad intro. that we jumped into something because actually as we bring our next guest on, yeah. he might have some perspective yes. on that. You know, just the idea that space and how we have that conversation and this line between um, inappropriate um, physical 
touch and boundaries yeah. that you might set, and also possibly a decent person that felt comfortable and felt that the green light was there. And I'm not saying that you did anything wrong, mm -hmm. but is it possible to have a conversation that's simply rooted in truth? Right. And hey, I'm not really ready for that. Um, it feels like you're moving at a level that I'm not ready to, and you get an opportunity to hear him respond. Maybe, yeah. maybe he responds with, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I never meant to do that. Yeah. I felt like we were safe, but fully hear you. Yeah. And you get to believe and trust his response or does he nut up? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but anyway, yeah, right. um, but with that, um, why don't we jump into our Let's episode? And, yes. and who do we have here today? We got somebody really special we and have, yes. I got to give some love after you introduce him. Okay. I love this. Uh, Prince EA, AKA Richard Williams is an American rapper, spoken word artist, music video director, and human rights activist from St. Louis, Missouri. And he uses spoken word and video to create impactful videos centered on mental health, motivation, and confidence on his YouTube channel. He's been on YouTube for a, a long, long mm -hmm. time. One of the earliest One of the to the platform. Yeah. That's right. Welcome, brother. Welcome. Thank you for being really here. Really good to be here. You made me feel old. No. <laughs> it ain't been that long. At least someone feels been, old yeah. besides myself. <laughs> but no, I'm so I'm super excited to be yeah. here. I love the energy. Mm. Well, you know what? What I want to do, I just got a text. Um, and this came from Justin. He texted right before we started it. He says, shower Prince with love for me. He's one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, so um, wow. sending love. One to of you. a yeah. kind guy that is. Justin, wow, yeah, I, you know, one of my first trips to LA, I I met Justin, and uh, he's just always been the same, the same genuine, authentic guy, just full of love, full of just heart. Um, love him, love him, love him, mm -hmm. and and I'm I'm really proud of him, and he's he's created so much good su success in a good way, because um, you know some people create success in other ways, but he's. He's, he's held true and uh, has done beautiful things in this world. So shout out to Justin. Yeah. Yes, indeed. You're listening to the Mad Enough Podcast. We'll be right back. Hey, everyone. It's Jamie Heath from the Mad Enough Podcast. Summer is right around the corner. And with the weather heating up like it is, it's more important than ever to stay hydrated and keep your electrolytes replenished. And that's where Element comes in. Element, spelled L-M-N-T, is a simple, no-sugar, artificial ingredients, coloring, gluten, or fillers added electrolyte booster. And it's suited to anyone following keto, low-carb, whole foods, or paleo diets. Now, as you all know, I've been a fan of Element for some time now. Between rounds of golf, hot summer days with the kids, and the general stress of a busy life, I can easily forget to stay hydrated and lose out on all the benefits of electrolytes like better focus and higher energy. And Element is great for me because it has zero sugar and it's got rich flavors like chocolate caramel. Now, I'm a big caramel fan, so that works for me. And it makes it really easy to drink throughout the day. Now, Element is completely risk-free. If the salty taste isn't to your liking, simply share it with a friend and get your money back. Can't beat that. So head to drinkelement.com slash man enough. And for a limited time, get a free Element sample pack with any purchase. That's drink lmnt.com slash man enough. Thank you to Element for supporting our show. All right. Welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. As we get started, let's start off with the first question just to mm. kind of like kick us off. Okay. Um, and Chris, you've been our go-to guy now. Prince, mm. when is the last time that you didn't feel enough? Growing up, feeling enough was always something that I... I wanted to be enough. You know, I had two older brothers and I felt I always felt like they were more loved by our parents than I was. And I always felt like I wasn't enough. And I think I, I definitely faced that early. But I did so much inner work um, throughout my life that allowed me to recognize that I am not this body, I am not these thoughts, I am, I am spirit. And I think only when we identify as spirit, because the person, you know, the Prince EA, the guy who's moving and shaking, making YouTube videos, the person can never be perfected, it can always get better. But the person, you know, the, the Greek word persona, which is where the word person comes from, it means mask. And you know, you ever heard the, the, somebody say, oh, man, you're acting out of character. I think we build these characters and appearances in life, 
And I think I did that early on until I recognized that I am something beyond hmm. the character, mm -hmm. the mask. And so it, it has been, to answer your question, it has been a while since I haven't felt enough because I stopped identifying with what comes and goes, which is this person. However, there are small moments where, you know, the ego comes in, where, you know, you're in a relationship, you might feel jealous, and jealousy comes from feeling not enough. Mm -hmm. So I do still experience tiny moments, but, you know, just like walking on a street and tripping over something, you catch yourself. And so when I trip over things in life and the ego comes out, I think I've done enough work where the reflex is to catch myself. Mm. Beautiful. Mm. Thank you. How do you know you're an ego? I think for a lot of men listening, I think it shows up differently for women and men, and even jealousy shows up differently for women and men. Um, how, how does it show up for you, and how do you work through that? Ooh, ego. One of the best definitions that I've ever found for ego is edging God out. I think it was Wayne Dyer who said that, edging God out. And I think any time you, and I mean, I'm not particularly religious, but I consider God to be love, the vibration, the energy of love. And so any time you're acting not out of love, but man, what's the flip side of love? It, it's fear, right? It's only two, just two things that we, two reactions that we have in this world. We're either acting out of fear, scarcity, or love, abundance. And so I think how do you know when you're acting out of the ego is fear, you know, it's not it's not a loving energy. Mm. Yeah, I love your your energy. Speaking of energy, just, just <laughs> <laughs> will you share with us why you do what you do? You obviously are in a space that you've been successful, but you've been successful in a particular area that, um, as broad as it is, seems to have a common theme mm. about advancing things. Ultimately, is the way I see it. You talk about masculinity, right? You talk about um, things that really pertain to I think the human spirit and um, how we can evolve to be better. Why do you care about these things? Why is this part of your work? Mm. Yeah, I, I just, I think it's my dharma. I think every person has a gift, um, some something inside of them that they've kind of been been born with. And oftentimes we reject that gift, right? We don't, we hear the phone ringing, but we don't answer that call. And I think, you know, when I answered that call, it was, it was, it became flow. I started out in music. You know, I achieved decent success, but I wasn't fulfilled. And so I did a lot of inner work to understand how can I be happy? I think every, I mean, we all want to be happy. Every single person does what they do to be happy. So I, I read every book I could find on happiness because I figured, you know, every, every problem that I'm ever going to have, somebody dealt with that problem and wrote a book about it. So I read everything from the ancient scriptures, the, the, the Taoist text, the Jain, the Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, Sufis, everything, psychologists. And um, I didn't find it in the palace. I didn't find it in the cabin. Uh, happiness is really is really within. In fact, you shouldn't even look for happiness. It's, it's really joy, I think, is what we all want. Because happiness, happiness is what happens to you. And if you live a life based on what happens to you, then you're you're a victim of what happens to you, and so um, joy is, is 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 peace, and it's this ever present um, isness that I think is within. And so once I kind of discovered that, I just wanted to share that. Mm. And so whether I'm speaking about you know the school system or uh, climate change or masculinity, it, it all really comes back to to finding that that peace, that joy within the individual. Because you know I, I felt like I wanted to share it. You know, why, why would I keep all of, keep this joy to myself and just live in a cave, you know, in the Himalayan mountains? Uh, I wanted to figure out a way to, uh, as the Buddha says, speak the language of, uh, of the times that we're in and try to convey these messages to people as, as cleverly as I can, right? Putting the aspirin and the applesauce. And so I try to put wisdom inside of entertainment. And is that how you found YouTube? Was that, that your vessel? You like saw this thing and you were like, oh, this is, this reaches humans. Mm. Actually, back in my music days, you know, I was like, why would I do a show in front of 
100 people when I could do a YouTube video and reach 100,000. I was always wanting to scale it. And my life was changed based on content, based on video. Um, you know, all these books that I had mentioned, I didn't, I didn't read the physical scrolls. You know, I was looking, I, was, I had the, the, the text and I had the audio book version. So YouTube changed my life. And so I, I used it as the vehicle to try to change others. And just, let's talk about masculinity. You know, it's yeah. something that you definitely really delve into um, in all of the work that you're doing. What was your, you know, was your relationship with masculinity always easy? Can you share sort of what that relationship was like for you? Growing up, playing baseball and getting hit in the face by, by baseball and, you know, hearing people say, uh, man up, be a man. You know, I'm you know, a little kid and you're hearing that. I think our culture has definitely influenced me in a in a negative way until I until I grew up and, and recognized that it's really, you know, it's not about masculine or feminine. It's, it's really about being you. I think masculinity is, is an energy that is held. But femininity, I say I'm, I lean a little bit more towards the, the feminine side because I value vulnerability and gentleness. I think this is the true strength, and I think these, these attributes are, are so often uh, characterized as more, more feminine. But it, it all comes down to fear or love, and I think it's so many, um, so many men that operate out of that fear, out of that defensiveness, out of that that strength. But you know, when you really understand that true strength is gentleness, uh, you you really got to move towards that direction. Um, Do you find that in our experience? I mean, I think all men are searching for what masculinity means and how to become a man and to where the, the balance is. For black men, our history is that we were not seen as men that we were not man enough, that we were called boys. Um, not even seen as people. Not right? even seen in as the, people, in right? Three-fourths yeah. in the Constitution. But, but mm -hmm. the narrative has always been um, that we were not man enough to be seen and valued. Mm -hmm. So when that is told to you as a culture, constantly you're trying to then prove yourself. I am a man, I am worthy. And then you might um, reach for things that are not so good but you see them as like acquiring money, status, women, chains, popularity, aggressiveness, because anything that you can grasp at to be seen as man enough is important. And I think it's, this is with all men, but particularly I know for my culture and for, you know, I, I don't wanna speak for you, but for black men, mm. this has been something that we have, I feel have, have needed to learn how to hold on to the things that are valuable and then assess the things that have, are not serving us mm. and humanity, even though it's understandable we would reach for them. Mm. Have you found any um, process with that? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a lot of posturing that that, of posturing. that happens. Um, and it's just, you know, you're just not living a true authentic self. And until you do that self-worth, you, you're going to continue to find your, your worth from the validation of the external world. Um, you know, but... <clears throat> I Just to play advocate, how do we know those people are not their authentic self? This this posturing, like someone with chains and this. How how do I know that that person's not? This is me. I'm my I'm my authentic self. Mm, yeah, I don't think I c you can know until you walked in their shoes. I think that's something that they have to um, recognize within themselves. I can't speak for somebody else's experience. I think that's that's not right, but. Um, I think we can we can invite people into another path. You know, I think success is being able to, to you know, go to sleep happy at night. But you can look at data, though. There is data when you look at young boys and you say, why is it that you want this money? Why is it that you um, have a lot of women? Why is it that you have these chains? Not that there's anything wrong with chains to begin with. But if you ask and the data shows, oftentimes the answer is, uh, I want to be respected. Mm -hmm. Right, and that right there shows that I have something. So I'm not saying that each individual like doesn't. It's not their authentic self. I don't want to challenge that with an individual. But the data shows oftentimes that these are symbols of success and prove my manliness or my worth. And it's not generally because oh, because I I love that. Mm -hmm. I love these cars. Sure, it's there, but it's like yeah. And and, and I stand yeah. with that. My nephew, you know, who I would love to embrace more soft skills, is obsessed with like wanting a Maserati and, you know, like, because the people he looks up to have those symbols of success, which right. we have 
spoken about even in my short time hanging out with y'all. Like, mm -hmm. how do we redefine the symbol of success? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and again, for women, the equivalent is like, you know, there are other things that where I see my niece, you know, really liking, you know, Barbie stuff or, or you know, things uh, with girls that, that I think are wearing a lot of makeup and have a certain body type. And I'm like, you're 10 years old. So it's, it's interesting, right? Like, you don't want to take the agency away from, from you know, wh whether it's a child or not, right? To be like, well, you like cars or you like girly stuff um, that might not give you the best body image, Um representations but but we know that that when they cling to that as an ideal and they feel like they need to achieve that um and if and and that if they don't they there there's all kinds of negative impacts on their health um i right. think that's where you go like we have to do we, you know we have to intervene but i think that's like what you're bringing up is really an yeah, important point it is and then it comes back to choice are you really choosing like am i really choosing mm -hmm. to uh do my hair mm -hmm. or am i doing it because i know you'll probably like me more. Yeah. And same thing with men and, you know, posturing. I think we, I think, because your question, how do you know that's not their authentic selves? I think you can look within yourself and your own experience because I've gone through those stages, you know, especially starting off as a rapper, you know, I mean, I wasn't, it wasn't always conscious. Right. It was posturing, you know, it was talking about, you know, the, 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 the money I didn't have, the cars I never drove, the chains I never wore in order to be approved in order to to create some type of stature and there was there was a an uneasiness about that that can only be found I think when you tune in you know Jim Carrey said I, I hope everybody can become rich famous and successful so they can know that that won't make them happy and I think sometimes we have to go through uh, these these situations we have to get it to know that actually that really wasn't worth it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I, I asked my my son is twenty, and he's got a lot of friends. You know, the same age. If you ask them, like, "Hey, in a year from now, how do you know that you're successful?" and the things that they will name and cite are different than if you ask a forty, fifty year old yeah. man, uh, like the question we oftentimes ask at your funeral, "What would you hope people would say about you mm -hmm. if you were at a ghost of your own funeral?" And oftentimes, people that are older won't say the same things that my son and his friends will say which is I got these cars, I got this, I scored 55 points in the game, whatever it may be, right? What they at that point see as success and man to be a man, it looks different as we get older. We posture a little bit less, um, we start making sense. What, what are some of those things that you have done, some of the work that you have done, because you had said what you, where you were, maybe to where you are now, mm. what's some of that work that you do? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it starts with meditation and, um, you know, I think a lot of people meditate to calm themselves, to de-stress, to be more productive. And I think these are great benefits, but I think they miss the goal of med the, go the real goal of meditation. And the real goal of meditation is to come back to the, your true self, mm -hmm. your true nature. And meditation isn't living with a, this quiet mind of, you know, no thoughts. I mean, that can happen, but it's really staying in the witness state before the thoughts happen. Mm -hmm. Um, or as the thoughts happen, to, to view thoughts as clouds coming and going in the sky. But you are that which can observe the coming and going without coming and going yourself. Mm. So true meditation is really going home and staying at that true space, the, the, the experiential knowledge that you are not this, this form, you are not these thoughts. Because if you were the thoughts, then when the thought went, you would go. You can't be this body because you can observe the body. Anything you can observe, you cannot be. There's a subject and an object. So tr true meditation is really understanding that you are this timeless, this eternal, this ephemeral, this ineffable energy that is within all beings. Mm. Mm. So, that, so that was a bit, <laughs> I know that sounds kind of no. mystical. Not to me. Okay. <laughs> um, but that's one practice. Um, Another practice is is really to recognize that everything that you see, everything in this room, every it, it all came from the human mind. Everything. It all came from the mind. It all came from thoughts. So to understand that we are not the thoughts, and so one practice that I love is whenever you get a, a thought, a positive, a negative thought, you say to yourself, who told you that? Who told you that? Whenever you get a thought, you say, who told you that? And then you, you say, oh, the mind did. 
And so this, this practice, what it does subtly is you, you create more and more distance from the mind, from identification with the mind, right? Because if you, if you live a life identified as the mind, you're in prison, you're in bondage, right? The mind is a great servant, but a horrible master. So to live as the master and to use the mind as a tool, this is, I mean, this is the number, this is the short path, this is the direct method to understanding who we really are and to identify as that. Can I push back? Yeah, push. Because this is the, something I've been working through. I'm, I'm with you on yeah. everything, and yeah. I, that's my idealized version of who I will at one point be. Mm. Meditating Liz, who's s- sitting still in her apartment. Not uh, We have an inside joke that I'm always somewhere um, walking. walking with coffee. I and laughed a, this and morning when bike. she said, I live in a coffee shop. And I was thinking of that yesterday. Yeah, it was, <laughs> pretty much there. I was like, you really might not have a house. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I have... Like I, I struggle with mm. stillness, mm. and but I have been putting in a lot of work to get to a place where I can d- s- believe what you're saying and not mm. like eye roll while I'm meditating and mm. saying like yeah sure my body's not me like I I'm trying to really work hard towards that. Mm. But here's the part where I'm at in my like healing journey, mm. and I, for people who are listening, I'm putting that in big quotation marks because I um, feel like that's even like a cheesy thing to say, but. <laughs> Where I'm like, okay, these are the thoughts that fuel all of these different co- behaviors that I don't like that I do, like mm-hmm. people pleasing, and you know, a- again, um, a lot of anxieties, definitely some, you know, uh, states of 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 sadness and depression, and you know, I've had eating disorders, like all these different different things. Where I'm like, I don't like these things that I'm doing, and then I go like, oh, it's a thought, and the and and the thought is wrong, mm-hmm. but then. I'm at the point where I'm like, okay, but if I stop doing all of these things, will I receive the same amount of love from a society Mm -hmm. that prefers me when I'm broken? Mm. And we live in a patriarchy and under patriarchy, women are preferred when they're broken and men are preferred when they're damaged. And so we reward men who have chains, who have girls, who have money. We reward girls who are obedient, small, Mm -hmm. uh, anxious, and want to make sure that you're feeling okay and your needs are before mine. And so I'm at the point where I'm almost like, struggling with this invisible monster. I'm like, let's get rid of this stuff. And then the monster's like, no, but then we're going to lose. Like, there's so much to Mm -hmm. lose if I actually lose all of the maladaptive coping mechanisms that that I know are hurting me, Mm -hmm. but are actually giving me not just like financial, but social rewards in a broken society. Can you give me an example of women that are rewarded for this small brokenness you speak of and then women who are not rewarded for their I don't know whatever the opposite of that would be wholeness I mean go under the comment section under any Lizzo's posts where she is like posting about her body and loving her body and like all of the men from like Ben Shapiro to um, you know Tucker Carlson to, to regular guys on the internet who are so angry at her for being fully herself in the body that she has and being very assertive and confident and not needing external validation, like not fitting into the male ideal of what a woman should look like or act like. Hmm. I mean, that's one of like a million examples. Um, And so, and, and then, yeah, like with men, the same thing happens, right? Like there are so many headlines about Prince Harry being pussy whipped basically, and that Meghan Markle is, like, in charge, and, right, like, men who are nice to women or who let women influence them are somehow lower in the hierarchy, or even men who don't do financially well, right? Like, poor, broke men, you know, you go on TikTok, like, you'll see a lot of women trashing them, and so there is a cost to not fulfilling the ideal of patriarchy, of capitalism, Mm -hmm. and so there are a lot of people who profit off of our brokenness. And so for people to then be like, okay, I'm just going to be me and uh, let go of, of this stuff. I don't have to compete. I don't have to, then it's like, but then what, you know, what happens? Are, are, are people at work going to still like me? Am I still going to be able to keep my job? Are my friends going to still like me? I don't know. There's like, mm-hmm. that's a real thing. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Liz. Wow. What do you got? Well, you touched on so much, so many just beautiful and real things there. Um, and I think the mind can, I mean, you, you said it right, right? Our society is, is based on 
feeling unfulfilled and broken. Mm -hmm. That's why we buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like, right? I mean, somebody said there's, there's no, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Right. I think that was Jiddu Krishnamurti. And I think we all have to make the decision on whether we want to be, you know, nice, happy slaves or really free. And the mind will always say, okay, but if I do that, then what, how, will, how will I make money? How will I, how will I fit in? And this, this comes back to trust. It comes back to really trusting the, the invisible, right? We trust the Uber driver to get us to where we need to go. We trust the pilot to, even though we don't know him, to take us to where we need to go. I mean, we trust the, uh, the chef at the restaurant to cook us food that won't make us sick. But we don't trust in the energy that brought us here to take us to where we need to go. And so this, this is why all traditions, you know, spiritual, even psychological, they talk about surrender. Yeah. Surrender and, and to dance with the unknown. One thing for me, uh, we mentioned, you mentioned death. And for me, death has been a, a big motivator. I think keeping death in your mind is the greatest life hack there is. I mean, it really shows you what's, what's true, what's real. Right. You know, they say in, in the, one of my favorite books, the... Tibetan book on living and dying. It says of all footprints, those of the elephant are supreme. And of all meditations, those upon death are supreme. In Bhutan, one of the happiest countries in the world, they say to be a truly happy person, you must think of death five times a day. And in our culture, our society, I mean, death is scary. The question that everybody has to ask is, do they want to make a better dream or do they want to just wake up mm -hmm. do they do they want to you know put you know a nice couch inside of their prison cell or do they want to be free <laughs> mm. yeah pleasure or freedom right like what are you seeking and if it's pleasure right yeah mm. you can continue with the brokenness and if it's freedom then I, I love how you articulate your thoughts and bring us back to spirit and intention and purpose and, and meditation and what joy really is. I, I'm a big, I, I, I just sent you a thing that I think I should read it. I've been thinking about it mm. with, um, with the, yeah. With what the joy, joy is. Fear. In fact, let me just hear it. Are you guys yeah, on a text without me? Is this what, uh, what I'm sorry, what's happening? Sorry. We'll start a third, but you probably uh, won't read it. Uh, I saw right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, let, let, let me just, uh, this is what I sent him yesterday. And I live, I have this printed up in my, in my house and it's a quote that I read often by Abdu'l-Baha, which says, in this world, we are influenced by two sentiments, joy and pain. Joy gives us wings. In times of joy, our strength is more vital, our intellect keener, our understanding less clouded. We seem better able to cope with the world and to find our sphere of usefulness. But when sadness visits us, we become weak. Our strength leaves us, our comprehension is dim, and our intelligence veiled. The actualities of life seem to elude our grasp. The eyes of our spirits fail to discover the sacred mysteries, and we become even as dead beings. There is no human being untouched by these two influences, but all the sorrow and the grief that exists come from the world of matter. The spiritual world bestows only the joy. I love this. I read this all the time because I believe that I am better. Mm. The world is better we are, when we are in our joy. Mm. If I want my house my home where I have multiple people living in to be flourishing and to feel joyful and to everyone to be well. I can't only just say meditate, live in spirit. That's important. That's the ultimate goal. But I have to see, is, is my wife happy? Is she getting her needs met? Cause if she's not, then my home is not going to be happy. Let's just say that's the whole world is my house. If my kids are not getting what they need, then that house is not going to be joyful. Mm -hmm. So I can't just say, you know, hey, everybody. Uh, I have to give practical th solutions. Then I have to look at myself mm -hmm. and say, here's our purpose, but now here's how we do the work. So as a man in the world, I have to make sure, like my own home, that Liz's needs are met, that people of different walks of life, their needs are met, people that have struggle with mental health, mm -hmm. people that are differently abled. Mm -hmm. In order to get there, we can't just use and forgive me because I'm not challenging anything you said because I believe in it. Mm -hmm. 
But the mystical and the beautiful poetry of it is not practical daily, daily things. So I'm always like, how do we achieve that? And then practically, what are you doing and my doing differently than our fathers did? Not that they're not wonderful. What are we doing better so that we are advancing society so that our home can have peace and can experience the joy? We have to live in a spiritual world with practical feet mm. every day. I hear what you're feeling and what the purpose is. Mm. Now I'm saying if there's a young boy that's saying, I want to be better, mm. tell me something you do practically that I can do, not just Zen mm. out, but work. Mm. That's what I'm curious about yeah, ultimately. It's a great question. And thank you for sharing that poem. Yes, sir. I love the ending. I love that last line. Meditation is not just something you sit in lotus posture and, you know, you're on your mat and, you, you know, your eyes are closed. Meditation in action is a thousand times better than meditation in stillness. Meditation is where the, the, the actions come from. So when you're in a meditative state, the actions come spontaneously. The right action comes from that. What are the actions? They happen spontaneously. So Give me an example of one. There's a quote. It's, hatred never ceases by more hatred, but by love alone is healed. If you're fighting against something, usually what you do is you create more of that, what you're fighting against. Right? What you resist will persist. But if you can come at it with a, a loving energy... And the action comes from that acceptance of, of what is, but still wanting to heal what is. This is, how, this, is, this is what I don't think we've ever done on this planet. Okay. I think we've been so, so driven towards, towards the, the ultra, and I'm going to say this word because you said it, but the direct practical, how to fix a symptom. But for me, I've always been interested in the root. Right. Mm, love that. If you see a tree that's sick, you know it's sick from you see the plant that the, the leaves are a little brown. But the gardener, the real gardener, wouldn't treat the leaves. They would they would treat the root. And so what is the root of our culture? But we need two gardeners. We need one gardener to change the root of it mm. to feed that. And in the meantime, while all these fruit are coming off and falling in the neighbor's yard and are a nuisance around, yeah. we need someone to help pick those things up, too. So. So, yes, yeah. to that. Ultimately, it's mm. the root of it. But in the meantime, mm. there are things falling over the earth. And, mm. and that's the stuff that I'm also interested in addressing mm. so yeah. that we can have. That's the practical things I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I think Pretty it includes it all. Okay. You have a, a mission mm. to end the mental health problem. Mm. Am, I, am I correct on that? Yes, I, I do feel like that my mission is to do what I can to heal people, especially from the mental health aspect. Yes. I'm assuming your way of doing that is not telling everybody just to meditate, right? Like, what are the, to, to return to the practical, I'm a 14-year-old kid, and, and I don't even understand the concept of meditation. I don't like myself today. I'm wildly depressed. Mm. Like, how do, I, how do I get dressed in the, in the morning? How do I put on my damn clothes just to leave my house? I think while the ego, um, you know, a lot of, you know, the, the spiritual and we, we, we kind of try to bash the ego. It's for some people, the ego actually needs to be strengthened first before it gets squished. <laughs> I think we actually need to strengthen people's confidence in themselves, in the doer of action before they can get to that place of, of true stillness. Mm -hmm. Mental health is so complicated. Meditation, yes, it's a, it's a huge benefit. And it saved hundreds, maybe millions of people from going through mental health issues. But so have pharmaceuticals, and a lot of people are against those. I'm, not, I'm for whatever works. And I think each person mm. has their own portal to freedom. So I think we, we need to look at all the methods. Um, the CBT, one of my favorite, um, if we want to talk practical, one of my favorite techniques in, cog so CBT for anybody listening, is cognitive behavioral therapy. It's the, it's the gold standard of all therapies. And, and CBT, I don't know if anybody has studied this, so CBT has a list of 10 what they call uh, cognitive distortions. Mm -hmm. I call them stinking thinking. And every problem that you're ever going to have, every type of suffering, 
mentally suffering is based on one or more of these 10 things. So first I'd say study that thing. Which What are the Google things? Me. Can you name a few of them? So one is all or nothing thinking. One is uh, what I call shooting or masturbating. <laughs> shooting yourself or masturbate, right? Shooting so what is, what is that? So when you put a should or a must on reality and not a preference. When you say he should act like this or they must act like this, you suffer. Who said they need somebody needs to do that or act? Who's, where is it written in the Ten Commandments or whatever commandment you go by that they should do that? People do what they do. But a lot of times our minds say, oh, they shouldn't have cut me off in traffic. And so we suffer. But if we put a preference on it, we don't suffer. We still feel it. But we, we recognize that the world is as, is as it is. And we shouldn't put uh, shoulds or musts on reality but we should put preferences on it. So that's a big one. One technique I was just telling a friend, a CB, famous CBT technique is, um, it's called the double standard technique. A lot of times we are very self-critical of ourselves, very self-critical. I shouldn't have done that. I'm a failure. I'm this and that. But the double standard technique says, talk to yourself like you're talking to a beloved friend with the same problem. What would you say? Right? So I studied under, he's kind of the, the grandfather of CBT. Uh, he wrote a book called Feeling Good. His name is David Burns. Mm. And um, he told a story about a woman who was dying of ovarian cancer. And she felt that the cancer was her, was her fault. She felt like she did it to herself. She felt like um, everybody blamed her for it that her friends and her family no longer loved her. And so basically what David Burns did, he asked her, um, would you talk to a beloved friend like this? Would you tell your beloved friend that your cancer is your fault? Would you tell them that, that your family and friends, they don't love you? So this, it didn't heal her. But in her final years of, ovar of having ovarian cancer, she died peacefully. And I think CBT is one of the most powerful techniques because it changes the brain. And I think everybody, even if you don't have any mental health issues, you can, be, you can benefit from learning CBT, right? They say if you're in a happy marriage, the best time to go to, go to counseling is not when you're angry and upset. It's when you're, you're loving each other and you're feeling good. So I think it's, just, it's a great maintenance thing. And it's, it's just, you just type in CBT cognitive distortions and you'll find it. And you, I say put this on your refrigerator door. And whenever you're feeling upset or suffering, go look at that. Mm, nice. Thanks for that. I imagine, of course, you're a good dude doing good work. You got good friends around you, other men that are on a path. What are some of those friendships look like? How do y'all hold each other accountable to keep growing and to progress and to do better, show up better just in life than we did last week? You know, I live by this mantra of bring thyself to account each day, ere thou art summoned to a reckoning. Every day reflect. Mm -hmm. bring thyself Say that again? To, bring thyself to account each day. Mm -hmm. Here thou art summoned to a reckoning. Mm -hmm. Every day so that tomorrow I can be better, can reflect and be better. That's the purpose mm -hmm. that has to be. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the process as well, but we have to. Otherwise, when we sit there and complain about how life is, if you want your job to look different next week, you can't do the same thing you did yesterday. Yeah. If you want your relationship to be better tomorrow, you can't just keep doing the same thing you did yesterday. Mm -hmm. If we want the world to look better, we want men to show up better, mm -hmm. We have to reflect mm. and then, you know, uh, um, attribute some of those reflections and learnings to our path moving forward. Mm. What are some of your ways? And I know I keep using the word practical, yeah. but <laughs> those things that you might do and suggest mm. how we can be better men. Mm. Or do you not think we need to be better men? Like there's no issue with masculinity and that we're holding on to like, you know, some stuff that we just have to let go of and, and embrace so that we can be better. Mm. I do. I, I believe in a similar concept as you. In fact, I, I, I repeat this mantra. And last week, um, Steve Harvey told this mantra to his audience, but it's, it's basically um, a, a phrase that I try to say every day. It was developed by a French psychologist. His name was Emil Coué. He says, in every day and in every way, I'm getting better and better. In every day and in every way, I'm getting better and better super powerful. So I think, I think we should strive to get better and better 
um, one of my practical um, thoughts that I like. I actually, I live in Europe, and I have this um, all over my house. If you came to visit me, you would see I have these signs. On you my say wall. you live in Europe? I live in Europe. Yeah, I live in Portugal. And you said if you come to go visit, if you come, okay. come and visit. Oh, okay, I accept the yeah, invitation. Come, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, anytime. All I right. got it. I got go, it. Ahead. go ahead. <laughs> But you come in my house, you'll see I got I got these signs around my house. And the signs say, what would your future most developed self do now? So every time I see that, I say, okay, what will my future and developed self, most developed self do now? What will my future most developed self eat now? So I have these reminders all over my house to help me create my best, highest, future, most developed self. So this is one thing that I kind of, I don't know anybody else who's doing it, but I've, I've kind of done it and it's totally helped me because it's so easy to get into bad habits and to get into the, um, the rigmarole of what the world needs. And really what the world needs is for you to be your best, highest, most developed self. Um, so that's one thing that I have, you know, we, 90% of our brain is dedicated to vision so when we see, and grocery stores do this all the time, that's why they put the nice, um, the nice products at the top and the ones they don't want you to buy at the bottom, they know because they're hitting you, it's, it's all psychology. So I've used this psychology in my own house to try to put myself in the highest and best state. So that's one thing. Right. Um, I think it's great um, to also, you, you mentioned friendships and to have groups of people around you, super important. I suggest, you said practical, I suggest that everybody audits their friend group. And it sounds very like, you know, business, but I think you just audit the people around you. Actually, you audit everything, your entire environment. If you, if you're really serious about this, and I talk about this in my, in my course, but, um, when you, when you audit, when you put it on paper, something happens, you can see it, it's physical, right? Don't just keep it up here. Don't, don't just keep it in your mind. Like I'm going to change my life. No, put it on paper, um, the most successful people think on paper. So when you write down, um, okay, is this is this person, and we'll use more business language, are they an asset or are they a liability in my life? How do they really make me feel? Uh, am I uh, are they my best friend in the in the terms of are they making me the best version of myself or helping me or supporting me? And are, am I doing the same for them? And so I think I think it's so important to really to really structure. Um, the people around you because energy is contagious. If I yawn right now, chances are everybody in this studio, or at least one person is going to yawn. Mm-hmm. Why is that? It's because we're connected. We're, we're energetic beings, right? When I smile, you smile, right? The same neurons in your brain light up when you see me smile. So keeping, keeping a group of people that light you up, um, that really make you feel good and support you is the most important aspect to success, to live in a happy, joyful life. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, we are coming right. to, a, I mean, a close, and, and I feel like what you've done is you've reminded us because we often can get, I can get heady, you know, because I want to see in my own life just results. But results don't just happen because I do believe, ultimately, I believe in spirit. Mm-hmm. I believe we are spiritual beings. I have a strong relationship with God. I believe in meditation. I believe this is where all source comes from. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes it's it's good to, I'm, I'm thankful and grateful that we had a conversation that it's more rooted in that mm-hmm. and everything doesn't have to be about, okay, what are we doing tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Um, to be your minded of another quote, sorry. Um, and Baha'u'llah says this quote, which is noble have I created thee, why dost thou abase thyself? Noble have I created that we are noble hmm. beings, and we have done some some of this destruction in the world to ourselves. Like hmm. and we're so noble. If we remember wow. that we are noble, wow. and we find that when we are in our peace and in our joy, hmm. and we are and remember, and then from that we might act hmm. in the ways that are practical. Hmm. So it's good to remember those things. So um, thank you for that. Hmm. I, pr- I really do appreciate it. Um, Should we close it out with our big big question? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Prince. That's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> what does it mean for you to mm. be man enough? Mm. Mm. <sighs> you know, I think it is our birthright to be enough. We can say man enough. I say to to really be enough. 
period. Because we are here. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to achieve anything. I think just recognizing the love that permeates is enough. And to be grateful for that, you know. Master Eckhart said, if, if the only prayer you ever said was thank you, that itself would be enough. Wonderful. Thank you, man. Thank you. You didn't expect this, did you? You you know, you probably expected us to go a different way. No, not at all. Not at all, actually. I mean, you know, this is why we have this conversation. We can't just have the same conversation Mm. over and over and over again. We expect Mm. for people to bring with their authentic self Mm. and have a conversation um, Mm. that's rooted in what we want to discuss, but allow it to be what it needs to be. Yeah. I love you you guys for holding the space for it and just allowing everything to emerge. And you have some very potent and real deep questions. Um, this was nice. This was a nice experience. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so Thank you. much. Mm-hmm. Well, um, how do we close out, Liz? Well, if you liked what you heard, you can check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or on manenough.com slash podcast if you like to use your browser. That's right. You can find And you can hear a lot of different episodes, different people, and Prince EA. Follow him. See yeah. all the great work he's doing. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for, for joining you. us. Uh, we'll see you next time. I'm Jamie Heath. I'm Liz Plank. I'm Christopher Rivas. And this is Man, Man. Man.